We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15, reading through verse 21, just so you'll know, verse 17 is our text this morning. But I want to read it so you get the entirety of the passage. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15, from the New International Version, the Bible says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Excuse me, that's the New King James Version. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you understand what Paul is saying in that passage of Scripture? Obviously, if we don't have an understanding of what God's will is for our lives, then we're unwise. That's what he's telling us. He's telling us, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, there's some folks that seem to think the will of God is like uh, hidden behind a door. Don't you think that if God created you and knew you from the beginning of the world, he also has a plan for your life? He wants to reveal that plan to you. Some people think it's like God uh, lets you walk past that door, and when you miss it, he says, ha, 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 you didn't find me. That's not the way it is. The Father longs to reveal himself and his will and his plan to you each and every day on a personal level and a personal basis. Verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all good things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now you can read the rest of Ephesians 5 and 6 and you can clarify what the will of the Lord is. I'm not going to deal with that this morning. We're going to talk about how we know God's will for our lives today. We've already talked about uh, we need to walk circumspectly, walk wisely, Be aware of our times. Measure and mark our footsteps and our lifestyles. So let's talk this morning about understanding and doing the will of the Lord. So many in our world today, especially Christianity, come to church and they say, Preacher, I need a word. Can I tell you that if you're going from church to church, preacher to preacher, crusade to crusade, seminar to seminar, looking for a word, you may be disappointed. Because the Lord has already given you a word. He's given you a word for every day. To know the will of God, you've got to be in the presence of God, and then you need to be in His word. Because through His written word, through His revealed word, He pours His will out to you and I. Paul said, don't be foolish, understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, you need to understand that God is much more ready to guide us than we are to be guided. Sometimes we think God says, well, this is my will, and then we have to approve it. This is my will. I'd really like for you to do that, but it's up to us to determine whether we do or not. And that's true. But we need to understand, if we understand and know the will of God, our responsibility is to follow that direction and guidance. He is more ready to guide us than we are often to be guided. Jesus said in John 7, 17, If anyone desires to do his will, speaking of God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, and he's talking about his teaching, the things that he is imparting to those that are listening to him, whether it's of God or whether I speak from myself. What is he basically saying? He's saying you can tell God's will and know God's will by what the book says and contains, by what I've revealed to you. Oh, come on, folks, this isn't magic. This isn't hocus pocus. You don't have to pray three prayers, give five offerings, do a service in the church for five years before God reveals his will to you. No, Paul says, understand what the will of the Lord is. It's a matter of walking up and accepting what he's speaking to you and me. Psalm 25, 12 says, what man is he who fears the Lord? He who he shall teach him in the way he shall choose. If we really reverence God, and that's what that word fear means in the writing of the psalmist, if we reverence God, if we acknowledge who He is, then God teaches us the way we should go. That's a great thing for you and I to know and understand and realize. I've got news for you. God's will is not that anyone should perish, but that all come to repentance. God's will is not that anyone be bound, but everyone be delivered and set free. 
God's will is not that you struggle with discouragement and depression, but that you're encouraged by the power of His might in your inner man. And you can rise above the circumstances of the day. We know we're living in dangerous times, right? Times that can cause us often to despair. But when that occurs and that feeling occurs, we need to step back and remind ourselves God's will has been revealed already. We just need to understand what it is. Kind of reminds me of the young man who uh, had eyes for this beautiful young girl. And every time he got around her, he was tongue-tied. He couldn't say what he wanted to say. And uh, <clears throat> some of you are laughing. You were in the class Tuesday night. By the way, we're teaching a class on Tuesday nights how to teach and preach. And when I looked at my notes this morning, I realized that probably we've got about an hour and a half worth. Everybody good with that this morning, an hour and a half? Yeah, I know that's a lie when you hold up your hands. I know you're not telling me the truth. You see, I told them Tuesday night that <clears throat> Americans are good for about 30 minutes, and then they check out on you. I could preach in Africa for two hours, and they'd be wanting more and more and more and more and more. But not so much here, you know? So I'm going to be aware of that, and Yvonne always keeps time for me, and she'll shut me down if I go over, right? Amen. No, she won't. She won't do that. Anyway, the young man had a girl. You thought I forgot where I was going, didn't you? A girl that he was absolutely infatuated with. He loved her, but he couldn't talk to her. He got tongue-tied, nervous, frustrated every time he was around her. So an older friend said to him, well, you just need to memorize some good things to say. Why don't you memorize this line? Why don't you say, every time I see you, time stands still? So he rehearsed that time and time and time again. About a week later, he saw her, and he started getting frustrated. He said, every time I... And then he couldn't remember the line. Finally, he said... Uh, your face will make a clock stop. That's what he got out. <laughs> See, that's the way we are in desperate times. We get things confused, don't we? We twist it around. We really don't understand what God wants us to do. We need to understand in desperate times, we don't give up. We don't give in. We don't sing another song or tell another story. We stick to the book. We stick to the gospel. We continue to declare when times are rough, we serve a good God. When times are desperate, we serve the God of eternity. We don't change our story because of the times. Listen to me. Neither do we buy into the line of the news cycle because of the times. We're not going to do that. That's not what believers do who understand the will of God. We need to understand that sometimes the things that make it difficult for us to live as Christians also make us better Christians. Well, I love the way you're shouting now. Because you thought when I came to God, everything's going to be rosy, hunky-dory, no problems, no hiccups, no bumps in the road. I got news for you. There's a very real enemy who's desirous to destroy your life. And if you focus on him or your circumstances, you take your eyes off God and you're going to lose what God has already planned for you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Hard times can be a blessing in disguise. When I look at the events of the world today, I recognize that this is a great opportunity for the church to rise up and take the gospel to those in need. Rise up and do something that you've never done before because you do have the answer. You do understand the way out. You are light in darkness. Rise up, church. That's why we're continuing to send relief funds to Puerto Rico, why we're partnering with a church there, why they're distributing it to those who can't get to the FEMA stations, who can't get out and get help for themselves, because we want to be a light in the middle of darkness. Hard times can be a great opportunity for Christians to rise up and do what God is calling us to do. So when it seems the world around us is going haywire, Everything's coming apart, just about to spin off of its axis. Then we need to understand that's the perfect time for the power of Jesus Christ to shine through you and me. It's the prime opportunity for you and I to be lights in the midst of the darkness. The darker the night, the brighter the light shines. Can you say amen? Kind of reminds me of that Friday in Jerusalem. Jesus had been beaten scourged, nailed to a cross, and he died. Those who had followed him were defeated, discouraged, despondent, hopeless, living in despair because their hope had died. What they had hung their wagon to was gone. 
But it wasn't but just a few hours later when on Sunday morning, Mary and the women went to the graveyard to anoint his body for burial. And there an angel said, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is no longer here. He is risen. And suddenly, what was all despair and desperation turned once again to hope and life when they realized Jesus is not dead, he is alive. And slowly that message made its way through his disciples. Listen to me. This is what I want you to understand. In desperate times, when it's dark outside, you and I live this side of the tomb. You and I live this side of the grave. You and I have a hope in us that cannot be taken away. It cannot be stolen. It cannot be compressed. It cannot be defeated because He is alive. Well, somebody get that in your spirit this morning. We live on this side of that empty tomb. We know He is resurrected. And if He has conquered death, hell, and the grave, He can conquer any dark times I'm facing. And He already has. He already has. So these are exciting days. When we talk about dangerous times, they're exciting days. They're amazing days. Yet at the same time, they're uncertain days. And they can be frightful days. All at the same time, it's all of that. So in dangerous times, Paul said... You need to understand God's will. So let's look at that one more time. Five, verse 17. Do not be foolish, the King James says. Do not be unwise, is what the New King James says. But understand what the Lord's will is. So I want to talk about God's will in two aspects this morning. Number one, I'm talking about God's sovereign will. This passage, there are many passages, pardon me, that describe God's sovereign will. One of the clearest that shows it absolutely without a doubt between father and son and the relationship that was there is Matthew 26, 39. When Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So he's declaring God's sovereign will over his life and over his circumstances. Not what I want, Father, but what you want. Do you understand every one of us need to submit to the sovereign will of God? Submit to God's will and pleasure and purposes in our lives. It refers to the sovereign plan of God that's going to happen in the coming hours. Now, this is going to twist some of you up. So bear with me so we can straighten you out once we twist you up. All right, fair enough. I mean, this is going to kick the feet right out of some of your modern theology, so hang on. You see, when you read Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28, Peter was testifying before the religious leaders. And this is what he said, the will of God was that Jesus would die. Look at it, Acts chapter 4, verse 27 and 28. He said, in this city... We're gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. He's talking about God's plan in Jesus' life. And he's saying that God's plan in Jesus' life was for Jesus to be crucified by the hands of sinful, evil men. Now, here's where I want you to understand this. In the sovereign will of God, God's plan and God's decree was his son would come, take upon himself the form of a man, die a, sin, die, a de- die a death and rise again on the third day. That was God's plan. Is there evil associated with that sovereign plan? There was certainly evil occurring, was there not? Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Roman soldiers, the Gentiles, the people of Israel who were saying, kill him and give us Barabbas, on and on it goes. Yes, there was evil happening. Don't miss this very crucial point. Herod, Pontius Pilate, the soldiers, the Jewish leaders, all were sinning in fulfilling the sovereign plan of God. Now, here's where I'm going to twist you up. How many times have you heard? I hear it all the time. Well, if God is so good and God is in control, then why are children dying of starvation? If God is so good and God is in control, then why do we see hurricanes bringing devastation? If God is so good and God is in control, then why do we see 58 people killed in Las Vegas? You hear this all the time. Do you understand that in God's sovereign plan, evil will occur and happen? It's just going to occur. 
So don't blame God for the evil that's occurring. It's not God's doing. It's the result of sinful man doing what sinful man does. See, if you try to reconcile the evil in the world with the goodness of God, you're never going to get there. It just doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because God has no evil in him. There is none of that in the Lord. Could he stop it? Of course he could. But he has a sovereign plan in place that allows men to do as they please. Kind of twists us up, doesn't it? Because we think, well, if God is all that great and God is all that good, then none of this should be occurring and happening. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. It's our sin. It's our sin nature. It's our desire and our debasement that leads us into those places where evil and bad things occur. It is not God's fault. But it does fall under God's sovereign plan. That God has provided a way of escape through Jesus Christ. But if we choose to reject Him, then our hearts will continue to be desperately wicked above all else. God's sovereign plan. So let me be very clear on this. Isaiah 53.10, I want to read you one more scripture about the crucifixion. Isaiah 53.10, the Lord says, it was my will that he should suffer. He's talking about Jesus. It was my will that he should suffer. It was my will that he should suffer. And his death bring a sacrifice to bring forgiveness. That's the will of God. Do we understand that evil things happen under the sovereign will of God? But it's not God's fault. It's simply the way things played out on planet Earth. So to be very clear, some things will come to pass under the sovereign will of God that God actually hates. You with me? You understand what I'm saying? You understand this concept that in God's sovereign will, evil things do yet occur. If I could just be in God's sovereign will. You are in God's sovereign will. He's already set it in motion. That's where you live. 1 Peter 3.17, Peter writes, now this one you're not going to like at all. It's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Wow, that's a powerful statement. You know, Glenn, about a year and a half ago when they wanted you to leave Woodville, it was because you were doing good. Not because you were doing evil. See, we have to understand we have an enemy. There is someone who opposes us. There is a force against us. And he desires to destroy the good that God is doing in and through us. So if in that process of doing the will of God and following him, we encounter some hard times, we should rejoice that we're counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I knew this was going to go over like a lead balloon this morning, but that's okay. You know, when the Holy Spirit speaks, you got to follow Him, right? But this will help you if you'll get a hold of it. If you'll dig in and grasp it, it will help you be a victorious Christian. Now, in that scripture that Peter is referencing, he's talking about unrepentant evil men harming Christians, causing them to suffer. That is all under the sovereign will of God. You know why I have a problem with Western Christianity? Because we think once I come to Jesus, everything's smooth. Everything's fine. I'll never have a bad diagnosis. I'll never have a financial problem. I'll never have a, an issue that I don't understand. Listen to me, friend. If you really serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you've immediately drawn a battle line and the devil's coming for you. You know why I have such a problem with that type of thinking? It's because I can go to Asia. I can go to the Middle East. I can go to Africa. I can go to countries in South America. And I can see great persecution against Christians and the church of Jesus Christ. And for me to stand here and say, if you know God, that's never going to happen to you. How then do I explain that? How then do I reconcile that in my theology and in my thinking? Well, they don't know what I know. Oh, listen, they know a lot more than most of us know. They're holding on to the only thing that makes sense, and that is that Jesus Christ is their Redeemer. He is worth dying for. I want to drive that into your spirit this morning. Peter said, if you suffer for Christ, it may be the will of God. I've got news for you. He's worth dying for. He's worth dying for. You need to live like he's worth dying for. And yeah, you may suffer a little bit. You may experience some hard times. But that's under the sovereign will of God. Under the sovereign will of God. Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. 
Paul said it this way, in him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What's he saying? He's saying God's sovereign will, we've got a place. It's exactly what he's saying in that passage of Scripture. There are so many other passages in the Bible that I could walk you through this morning. Matter of fact, we could spend an hour just talking about God's sovereign will as revealed through the Scriptures. The Bible teaches that God's control, God's guidance, God's governance covers all of creation. From the greatest thing down to the most minute. I'm not sure I believe that. Well, read Matthew chapter 10. Read verse 29. It says that God notices every sparrow that falls. That's pretty minute, isn't it? He also said, God knows the number of the hairs on my head. That's pretty minute, isn't it? Proverbs 16, 33 says, the lot is cast in the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Proverbs 16, 1 says, the plans of the heart belong to man. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The Lord has the final word. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. We have to understand the sovereign will of God simply means God has a plan in place for this planet and for every one of us in here. And God's will shall be accomplished. It will come to pass. Just as Jesus died and rose again from the dead, his will will come to pass. Daniel chapter 4 verse 35, Daniel wrote, He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? What is Daniel saying? God's in charge. God's the ultimate authority. The buck stops at the throne of God. God has a sovereign will and plan that's being executed on planet Earth yet today. So there is the sovereign will of God that we can't change. We can't alter it one iota. It's in place. It's going to happen. Secondly, let's talk about the commanded will of God. And the commanded will of God, we can either obey or disobey. It's a will of decree. And it's our choice whether we choose to obey and follow Him or turn and go another way. It's completely up to you and me. Matthew 7, 21, the Bible says these words. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So how do we know we're going to make it? By doing the will of the Father. How do we understand we have a relationship with God through Jesus? By doing His will. By doing what He asks us to do. You know, when we stand before God, and all of us at one point will stand before God, we'll either stand before the Bema seat, which is the judgment seat of Christ, and give account for our lives after we knew Him, or we'll stand before the great white throne judgment because we didn't know Him, we rejected Him. But every man, woman, boy, and girl at some point will stand before God. And when we stand before God as believers, the question He's going to ask us is not how much you gave to the church, not how much you volunteered in your local congregation, not how many people you won to Christ, not how great people thought you were. The question He's going to ask is, did you do what I asked you to do? Did you do my will? You see, that's a prerequisite for understanding God's will in our life. It has to be our willingness to do what He asks us to do. Not everyone, according to Jesus, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. Now, you understand he's talking about religious people here. And he's saying not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's a pretty sobering thought when you think of it, but he's making it very clear. If we want to make it to heaven, we got to do the will of the Father. Say amen or say oh me, that's a true statement. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 is another command God gave us. We can obey it or we can reject it. It's up to us. Paul writes it this way, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. We can say yes, I'm going to do that. We're going to say no, that doesn't apply to me. I'm going to live as I want to live. But the Bible says this is the will of God. 
that we live lives that are holy and pure and sanctified unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the will of God. Don't argue with me. I didn't write those words. Take it up with Paul. Take it up with Jesus. Take it up with the Holy Spirit. Don't argue with me. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul gives us another directive revealing God's will. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. When the diagnosis is bad, give thanks. When the bank account is empty, give thanks. When your spouse turns against you, give thanks. When your kids are in rebellion, give thanks. When the business is failing, give thanks. When your church is falling apart, give thanks. Oh, come on, somebody, get it in your spirit. Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God. You know why he tells us to do that? Because he knows if we begin to be thankful, it changes our perspective. It changes our focus. It causes us to center in on the fact how good God is, how faithful He has become. When your spouse dies, Edry, give thanks to God in all circumstances, in all circumstances, even circumstances that don't deserve praise, give thanks to God. God's got something for you. He's going to walk you through it. He's going to take you through. So how do we learn the will of God? Number one, I told you, we've got to be willing to do the will of God. We've got to be willing. If you're not willing, why are you even here this morning? If you're not willing, why even try? If you're not willing to do what God asks you to do and reveals to your heart, why do you call yourself a Christian? If you're not willing, why bother? Just go live the way you want to live, enjoy yourself, and then face Him in eternity. There's a little bit of facetiousness in that statement. You realize that, right? I want to make sure you did. We have to do, be willing to do the will of God. Secondly, we need to immerse ourselves in His Word. Listen, the majority of Western Christians get the Word 30 minutes on Sunday morning. It's not enough. It's not going to do it for you. This book holds timeless truths, guidance and direction, wisdom and counsel, hope and inspiration. All you have to do is open the book. You need a Word, it's already here. But you got to search for it. you got to study. you got to seek out what God is saying to you in circumstances and situations. Don't turn to God's promises for today. I'm telling you, don't do that. Turn to the Word of God. See what God's Word has to say to you, for you, and through you in your circumstance and situation. God's Word will never fail you. Why? Because Psalm 119 says... His Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. If I want to know what God wants me to do, I find it in His Word. Listen, so many people are trying to be prophets, give people words about their future. Let me just speak that to that, okay? If someone comes up to you and say, I've got a word for you, every red flag ought to go up because you're going to measure that word. You're going to test that word against God's revealed will in your life and against God's word. So you don't just open your heart and accept everything that somebody blubbers all over you. If someone says, I've got a word, check it, test it by the word of the living God and by what the Holy Spirit has revealed to you. And I assure you, if God hasn't already talked to you about that, it's not from him. Come on, and if the person has to ask you 27 questions before they give you the word for you, they're no different than the fortune teller down here on North Monroe that charges 20 bucks to read the cards. Come on, this is true. You don't need a word from somebody. You need a word from God. And the word from God comes through His Holy Spirit by His living word. Now, are you saying, Steve, are you saying, that the word of wisdom doesn't work? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when we are in the presence of the living God, God confirms His will. He confirms His word with what He's already revealed to us. He doesn't send us out in left field chasing butterflies. He confirms what He's already spoken. We need to understand that. So we immerse ourselves in His word to discover the will of God. We surround ourselves in His Spirit to discover the will of God, and we make ourselves willing 
to do what he asks us to do. Then you will discover the will of God. Someone said, well, I came so I could know what God's will is for my life. I just told you how to find it. Three simple ways. You see, it's not rocket science. For generations, the Holy Spirit has been revealing God's will to men and women. I remember old Gideon. You remember Gideon in the Old Testament? Gideon, who was from the tribe of Manasseh, the least of the least. Gideon, who was afraid of his own shadow. He was down in a hole in the ground, a wine pit, grinding out some wheat so they could make some bread. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Gideon, thy mighty, thou mighty man of valor, you're going to save Israel. He's looking around, who are you talking to? It surely isn't me. I'm a coward. You see, when you receive a word from God, it's going to take you where you've never been before. It's going to expand your faith, expand your vision, cause you to believe that through God, I can do valiantly when it's a word from God. But when it's some believer trying to be super spiritual, you're going to hear it and say, well, that was the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. And can I tell you, it's okay to reject that nonsense. But listen for the true word from the Lord that aligns itself with His word and what the Holy Spirit has revealed in you and to you. So two types of God's will. One is God's sovereign will that we can't alter, that will come to pass. The second is God's commanded will that we choose to be a part of or not. We choose to buy in or not. We choose to say, that's what I want for my life, or we reject it. His sovereign will always comes to pass. It is never broken, never fails short. But His commanded will is where you and I have an opportunity to be a part of what God is wanting to do in our lives. So how do we know God's will for our life? By spending time in His Word. By spending time with Holy Spirit. By saying, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Now friends, this isn't a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. If you don't want God's will for your life every day, then you have to seek Him every day. You need to be in His Word every day. You need to be every day submitting and surrendering yourself to Him, saying, I will do what you ask me to do. We submitted our will to Him almost four years ago when we came to Christian Heritage. Yvonne and I did. But it isn't just a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. Back in December, we were traveling, and I was telling her about it, the series Capacity that was going to start in January. And I told her the story about when Cortez landed on the shores of Mexico. He was the third conquistador to land there. The other two had been driven out and defeated. When he landed with his soldiers and his horses and his rations, then he said to the sailors, you're not going back out and waiting on us. You're going to go back and burn the boats. Burn the boats. He was saying, there is no plan B. Some of us need to understand if we always have plan B in reserve, we may never see what God wants to do. Amen. So in that conversation, and this was an extended conversation we'd had many times before, and I had been holding back. She said, well, we should burn our boats. Okay, Yvonne, what does that mean? It means that we need to get rid of plan B and buy a house and establish roots in Tallahassee. Scared me to death. Scared me to death. We prayed about it, and we said, okay. So Daryl Will, stand up, Daryl, right back there, one of the best realtors in Tallahassee. Daryl started showing us houses. This was in January. We saw houses for month after month. We actually, the first one he showed us, the second one actually we wrote a contract on. Got through the process, we gave notice in the house we were leasing, and it got released. Someone else is going to move in on March 1st. Well, about a week and a half, two weeks before we were to move into this house that we had bought, an inspection came back with $40,000 of the damage the, the seller wasn't going to cover. So it blew up. So now we find ourselves literally homeless. Where are we going to live? What are we going to do? We know God said buy a house. We don't want to lease another place. We'd be in disobedience to God. What are we going to do? Well, it just so happened, not what we wanted, but it worked out. Just so happened there was an empty unit down in the plaza right next to Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> so we put everything in there and we lived there. We thought it would be a couple of weeks at the most, maybe a month. Four months later, seven contracts later, June 23rd, we finally bought a house. Now, we're sitting through that time thinking, did we not hear God right? 
Why is this so difficult? Why is this so hard? Why has everything fallen through? Why won't anyone accept our full price offers? We don't understand any of this. Let me explain it to you. When you determine to do the will of God, the enemy, the adversary, will do everything in his power to defeat you, to discourage you, to cause you to turn away. But there's got to be something in you that says, I understand what the will of God is. I understand what God has said. And I'm going to do it. Six months, seven contracts. Daryl was worn out. We wore him slick looking at houses. Finally got where we wanted to go. Got out of the unit next door to Chuck E. Cheese. Praise God. So are you willing to do what he asks? That's my point. Are you willing to do what he asks? Let me remind you again, we live this side of the empty tomb. And the empty tomb says we are victorious over every circumstance, every situation, every attack, everything the enemy forms. Oh, I want you to hear it this morning. Isaiah pinned it years ago. We need to understand no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in condemnation, you will condemn. Understand that's the will of God. These are great days, exciting days, frightful days, uncertain days, all at the same time. But Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said it so clearly. Why are you worried about it? You need to expect some difficulties, expect some hard times when you're doing the will of God. Because if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Exodus 15, 2 says, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Deuteronomy 31, 6 declares, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, There is no rock like my God. 2 Kings 6, 16 says, Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. Oh, come on, somebody. If you're doing what God asks you to do, walk in victory. He's already provided it. Already provided it. This is how we live in the light of this understanding of God's will. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul said, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know Your labor is not in vain. Stand firm. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And when you gain that understanding, then stand firm. Let nothing move you. Knowing that when we give ourselves fully to the will of God, our labors will not be in vain. So be encouraged. Don't let your heart be troubled. Watch your step, redeem the time, and understand what the will of the Lord is. Martin Luther King's final speech was on April the 3rd, 1968. It's the day prior to him being assassinated. He was speaking in Memphis. And in that speech, if you haven't read it or watched it, you should do so. It's very inspiring, especially now that you know what happened the next day. In that speech, he said, suppose God were to come to me and ask me, what age would you like to live in? And then he began surveying all of human history. He went back to Egypt, and then went to Greece and to Rome, and then he skipped centuries to the Renaissance, and then a Protestant Reformation, and then to the days of Abraham Lincoln, and then to 1968. And in 1968, it was much like it is today. It seemed like the fabric of the nation was being ripped apart and unraveling. And then he said, suppose this was my answer to God's question. I turned to him and I said, strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. That's a strange statement because the world was all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land. Confusion is all around. It's a strange statement, but he continued and said, I know somehow that only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. 
Oh, come on, church, it's time to quit resisting, and it's time to engage and understand God has called you to be a light in dangerous times. He concluded that speech by saying, I don't know what will happen now. We have some difficult days ahead. I just want to do God's will. I read those verses, that statement again this past week, and it just struck me. Seven words that can change an individual, change someone's future, even change a nation. I just want to do God's will. Seven words summarize how we should face the future, how we should live in dangerous times. Understanding God's will. Understanding what God has for you and me. I believe we should seek to do God's will every single day. We should understand what the will of the Lord is. We've talked about God's sovereign will. We've talked about God's commanded will. And now it's God's revealed will to you. See, I can't tell you what God's will is for your life. If I do that, I'm just another religious huckster. I can tell you that he wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be the one that never leaves you and never forsakes you. He wants to be your peace in the midst of troubled times. He wants to be your hope in times of despair. He wants to be your answer when all you have is questions. He wants to guide and direct your steps. He wants to illuminate your pathway. He wants to fill you with His love and His light so that you shine bright in darkened times and dangerous times. I can tell you, He has a plan for you. Because he told us that in the book of Jeremiah. I know the plans I have towards you, for you. Plans of peace and not of evil to bring about an expected end. You see, he's already got your end written. The question is, will you find him? Will you follow him and allow that end to be completed in your life? You know, so many times when we're talking about the will of God, people say, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I've blown it. I once knew God, but I've turned my back. I've walked away because I messed up too greatly. Can I tell you that if we go back to last week and we talk about redeeming the time in that whole concept, there is the aspect of when we come back to God and turn our face toward God and begin following God, we buy back opportunities we have squandered. We have opportunity again to declare matchless truth that we have let slide by. We can be influences in the lives of those we once destroyed when we allow ourselves to redeem the time and understand what the will of the Lord is. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you've been faithful or unfaithful to the Lord or never ask Him to be your Savior. All that matters is this morning you come to an understanding is I need to know God's will for my life. I need to understand what the will of the Lord is. Because if I'm going to get to heaven, Jesus said, I've got to do the will of God. That's what he said. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed across this room this morning. You're in this place today and you need Jesus to come into your life, to forgive you, to cleanse you, to change you. You need some new opportunities, new life. You need to be forgiven, your heart cleansed, your life changed, and the Lord to do a good work in you. It's not, he's not willing that you die and go to a devil's hell. He wants you to be saved and live for him every day of your life. You're in this room this morning and you say, Preacher, it's exactly what I need, exactly what I've been searching for. I need Jesus to come into my life, and then I need him to show me how to live for him and walk with him every single day understand what his will is for me I'm tired of floating I'm tired of being up and down tired of being encouraged and discouraged I'm ready for Jesus to take control of my life that's you I've just talked about you described you slip up your hand and say pray for me pastor that's me that's me yes sir yes sir others as I wait another moment yes ma'am others as I wait another moment that's me I want Jesus to come into my life. Slip up your hand until I see it. Someone else. God's talking to you. Yes, ma'am. Someone else. Yes, ma'am. Someone else is awaiting another moment. God's talking to you. This is your day and your opportunity to let God turn your life around, to redeem some time 
Start living the will of God. Anyone else want to join these many who have slipped up their hand and say, that's me. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? This is your time. This is your opportunity. Understand what the will of the Lord is. He's not willing that you perish, but you come to repentance. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 10.30, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.